Hello, welcome back today. Um, as you know, I've started a new series, Working Through the Gospel, which is the amazing news, fantastic news about God. And last, in the last episode, uh, hopefully you started there, if not, go back to episode one where I talk about storms and foundations. I started into the presentation of the gospel from our point of view, from our perspective in this world, in our lives, right? Jesus was at the end of his Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew 7, talked about this idea of foundations and storms. We all have a storm in our life. And ultimately the question is based off of your foundation, is your storm weathering you or are you weathering the storms, right? We see that Jesus desires to be our bedrock, our foundation for our lives, because we all will have storms, because we live in this broken world, it's messed up, and he desires to be with us through our storms. And he won't keep us safe from storms, meaning that it's not that if we have a relationship with God, storms won't happen, but he will keep us safe in our storms. And he will actually use our storms to build us and mold us and shape us, and he will use us to touch others' lives and their storms. And so today, continuing in this gospel message, I'm going to talk about from the beginning, really, ultimately, where everything started. And I think the greatest question we have that, that the gospel answers in creation is our identity. Right? We, in this world, especially I think today in this day and age, we have an identity crisis. Who am I? This is this great question that we all ask. And we all seek to answer it, and we answer it in so many ways. Uh, I think as a young adult, often people are going to college or finding a career or whatever. They're answering the question of who am I based off of what do I do? What's my value in society? What's the mark I'm going to make on this world? Right? And so sometimes our question of identity, we, we answer that with our bank account. We answer that with our talents, our careers even our looks. Uh, another popular one in identity is people look at their sexuality and they try to answer the identity of who am I based off of who do I sleep with? Um, how am I formed? How can I reform myself and re-realize myself? We answer this a question of identity in so many different ways, but at the heart, it, the good news of the gospel answers this question. And it's not that there is a truth there, there is a solid answer of who am I, but it starts with who is God, right? And so if we look at Genesis 1, it tells us back in the beginning, and I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to go Old Testament and New Testament on this. The first question is who is God? And it tells us in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So we see that in this first five books of the Bible that, that Moses wrote, who was he writing them to? He was writing them to Israel as they were being freed from enslavement in Egypt. And now they're, they're walking to their new promised land. God had fought for them. He chose them. And then he kept them safe. And by grace, through faith, covered in blood, he, he freed them from bondage, from these plagues, from enslavement. And now he's answering this question of, who is your God and who are you as they're walking through the wilderness, right? And we see here in Genesis 1 that their God is not a created being. Their God is not just a stone or an idol that they formed. Their God is not just some spiritual force. Their God existed before creation and in perfect relationship. We, we see here as we look in the text that the, the God himself was a plural Elohim, right? But with one name, Yahweh, as we look through even just the first chapter of Genesis. And we see that he's, he's father, he's, he's someone who's sovereignly in charge. There's, there's, the, son, there's the plurality here, there's the Trinity. There's the, the Son who actually does the work of creation, and then there's the Spirit who energizes it, right? And we see this also in John 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God right? Um, and I'm just going based off of memory there, right? He says he was in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness 
and yet the darkness did not overcome it. God existed before creation. God himself, in perfect unity, made everything, and he made it good, right? It also tells us in Colossians, it's, it's helping us understand this text too, of, of who God is. Um, let me get there real quick. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and by him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Right? And so here's a couple different texts talking about the fact that, that God was before creation, already in relationship. God did all of creation, right? And so as I was kind of teasing this out and answering this, right? I came away with the fact that, that God is a relational, anointed creator and perfecter. God himself made everything while in relationship, even the project of making everything was a relational act, right? And, and he is this amaz amazing imagination and creativity, but he didn't just create it and let it be. There's this idea called deism, right? Which a lot of the founding fathers were deists. And they believed that, yes, there was a God, he made everything, and then he stepped back and he's not, he might be relational with himself, but he's not relational with us. And he left us to just try to figure it out. And that's not true of the God of the Bible, of our God. Our God is an amazing, amazingly imaginative, amazingly creative. He's so anointed in that, right? And he's also relational, not just with himself, but with us. And so in relating to creation, he also is continuing the work of perfecting his creation. Right? And so in the beginning, we even see that in the Godhead that he was relational. Right? He made us and he walked with us. Right? And he desired us to be co-creators along with him. And I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm kind of jumping the gun here. But I just want to say in the idea that who God is, we also understand that this is all not just some cosmic accident, right? Things didn't go from just nothing to somehow coming about. Things, right, there wasn't just a bang and accidentally we have all of this organization from chaos, right? Things don't go from chaos to organization, right? Things go, if anything, from creation, from organization to chaos. Things tend to fall apart over time, not miraculously just accidentally coming together right god did this right and the beautiful thing if we start there then the question is once we know who god is we can answer that question who i am right psalm 139 is a great great text that a friend of mine pointed out to me this week i was gonna go with with another text right but in psalm 139 and we're looking at verses 13 and 14. And here he says, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. Right? So the psalmist understands that there's a creator God. The, the creation itself is not a cosmic accident, but there's there's someone behind it. There's someone organizing it and holding it together and directing it. And in understanding that also, he created me. It's a really important question for you to, to answer and understand. An amazing truth, rather, is that you're not a cosmic accident. Right? If you're an accident, who cares if you make it or not? If we're all, if this is just one big cosmic accident, there is no God, there really is no moral guiding then in all honesty, we should follow Darwin fully out and just say that we need to be the survival of the fittest. We, we need to be the best that we can be. So we should actually weed out the weakest of the gene pool. And we should just right, continue to be the best form of humanity that we possibly can. And that's who should survive. But that's not the truth. 
If we are not a cosmic accident, if God designed us and had a plan for us, then every single one of us matters. You matter. You matter to God. He intentionally designed you, even in your mother's womb, right? Though he crafted Adam from clay and he crafted Eve from, from Adam, he crafts each of us individually through that work of, of, of human beings procreating, right? You're not an accident. You were knit together on purpose. You were wondrously made. And continuing on from that, in the Old Testament, both in Deuteronomy 14.2 and Exodus 19.5, we see God speaking of his people as his treasured possession. They either will be his treasured possession because he's fighting for them, he will have them. They are his treasured possession. In fact, in, in Genesis 11, we see that humanity is so wicked and completely against God, and he allows them to, to leave. He doesn't restrain them. He doesn't enslave them. He lets them go, but then he picks somebody, Abram, and says, I'm going to make a new nation through you, and your mission is to bless the world. I'm going to go back and save the whole world through you, right? And so, man, he created us in the beginning in, in Genesis, and he created us to be his, his image bearers with, with a mission of co-creating along with him. And then when we sinned, he still continued to pursue us. He, he didn't give up on us and start over with somebody else. But he continued to chase after us because he desired us to be his possession. And in that, I mean relationally his, intimately his, along with him. He, he doesn't want to leave us broken. He gave us a choice to love or not. And when we chose not to, he still desired us and decided to fight for us and not give up on us. It's a beautiful truth. It tells us in John three sixteen that for God so loved the world not just the church, not just Christians who already follow him. God so loved the world that he sent his son to come and save us, that whosoever would believe in him would have eternal life. And that doesn't just mean that we don't go to hell when we die, but having eternal life means that we regain intimacy with God now. Eternal life starts at that moment of us responding to him and realizing our true identity, his creation, his desired possession, right? Meant for intimacy with him, right? And so he desires us. He created us, right? It also tells us in Romans eight twenty eight, it says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who were called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And just to kind of bring that down, right here we see that, that we are called. Again, we are desired. We are invited is another way to say that. We're invited into intimacy with God, right? For the purpose of conforming us, right? Changing us, transforming us. Right? Because though we were, we were a good creation in the beginning, because of sin, we are now born with this stain on us. We're all broken. You don't have to teach a child right, to say no or to fight. You have to teach them to obey, to be loving, to be selfless instead of selfish. We're just born that way. Right? And so he calls us for the purpose of transforming us, molding us in the image of his son. Right? regaining that image of God that he designed us to be, right? And in that, that the result is going to be our, our ultimate joy. Because as we're not image bearers, like as we are not looking like his son, right? As we're just living in our sin, we'll just call it that, right? We actually are continuing to hurt ourselves and hurt others around us. We're part of the problem. We need to be conformed. We need to be saved, ultimately, from ourselves, Right? So he's called us, he's conforming us, and he's perfecting us. Right? That, that in the end, he says that we're going to be justified and glorified. Right? And in that, we're going to have the, the greatest joy that we ever have, the joy that we were intended to have. Right? And that's an act of love, that working on us. Right? Tim Keller says it like this. He says, love is an effort and desire to make someone else everything they were created to be. So this work of saving us and conforming us, 
right? Guiding us through this life that, that shapes us is an act of love on God's part because it's not just that he sees your potential, right? But he sees who you were created to be, but you're, you're not realizing yet. And he knows that our greatest joy will come from our being conformed. And so he did this, does the work, right? He doesn't give us a list of behavior modification, right? He doesn't say, here's the steps to be conformed. Here's the steps to be perfected. And then, no, he tells us the instructions in the Bible are abide, abide in me. You can't do this change on your own. There's no step process to behavior modification that's going to make you conformed and be a better Christian and, and then be a perfect human. And then I will accept you. No, he says, humble yourself, lay your brokenness down at my feet and just cling to me because I love you. I desire you. And let me do the work in you. And ultimately then, he has a purpose for us. There was a quote. I love the Marvel movies. And I love watching even the, the spinoff shows with my kids. There's, there's one called What If? And one in there, T'Challa says, No treasure is worth as much as the good that can be done with it. And I think that this, this speaks into this, this gospel presentation, this, this call of identity too. We are his treasured possession, but God doesn't, he doesn't save us so that the, the grace of God, the blessings of God would terminate on us, right? He desires not just to get it to you, but to get it through you. So part of your being treasured is that you also have a purpose, right? God doesn't just want me to be happy, healthy, and wealthy, right? He wants me to have a purpose, to live my purpose, just like he created in the garden. He created them and said, work the garden, cultivate it, make it into a city garden, fill it with, with beings that are, that are also spirit-filled, right? And, and make it a great place. Be a creator, be a co-creator with me. And now he's still calling that same thing to us. He calls us ambassadors of Christ. That's what it says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. Right? In Corinthians, he's talking about the fact that, man, you've been saved, right? He's done this work in you. And here in 16 through 20, it says, From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It doesn't terminate on us. It doesn't end on us. He says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So he's given us a purpose, a mission, right? Where is treasure possession, right? For something, right? He not only did he lay down his life and did he go through all this work to reconcile us to himself so that he could conform us, but he has a purpose for us doing the work of reconciling others, redeeming others, spreading this joy to the world. We're part of the mission of recreating the garden, making a fuller garden city that we're going to be able to live in forever and eternity with God. That starts now. And this all results in our greatest joy, our true identity, realizing our identity as creatures of, made by God, being the creation of God, being worthy for God to come and redeem himself that he would chase after, right? And then joining him in co-creating, imaginatively, anointedly in this world, it results in our greatest joy. I was brought again to the, um, Psalm 51. It's actually a psalm of repentance. It's actually a psalm of, of mourning. It's a psalm where David has realized that even though he, he is a man after God's own heart, he sinned. He messed up royally. He, he committed adultery. He slept with his friend's wife. 
And then in trying to hide it, he tries to get his friend drunk so he'll sleep with his wife and won't realize that he impregnated her, right? But he won't. So he ends up killing his friend, right, to hide it and then marrying his wife, right? And then realizing this total mess. In Psalm 51, he pours his heart out to God and is like, man, I'm, I'm part of the problem. I'm, I've done something evil and wicked and I should have known better. And in that, he pleads with God, restore the joy of my salvation. You wouldn't think that this would be a text to go to explaining the joy that God has given us. But man, David's a man that we can see had amazing joy. One of the stories that always touches me is they had the Ark of the Covenant, was, which this place that the Spirit of God would, his presence was a sign of his presence, right? And so they would actually put this in the tabernacle or in the temple, right? And it's there that God's presence would be and they would offer sacrifices and they enjoyed communion with God here. And so they had... It had been taken from them primarily because they were not actively worshiping God and it was part of their, the consequences of their sin. But God allowed them to rescue the Ark of the Covenant, to bring it back. And so there was this point they were bringing it back to Jerusalem, the, the city where God's temple would be, the city where his tabernacle was, right, in the nation that was his. And when they're bringing this, this sign of the, the presence of God David had amazing joy. He was singing and dancing and offering sacrifices. They had this amazing party celebrating it. And he was so overjoyed that he actually embarrassed his wife, right? Because his clothes are coming off and he's dancing and looks a fool, right? Because he's focused on God and his presence, right? And there's a picture of, of joy. He was all in celebrating and excited about God and his relationship with him. And here he is after sinning saying, Give me back that joy. And joy is something we should experience when we have a relationship with God. Being a good Christian doesn't mean you're going to walk around bored. It doesn't mean he takes all the, the fun out of your life, which is, I think, something that the world really pictures. Even a lot of Christians, people that are cultural Christians, right? They're, they're like, oh, now that I'm a Christian, you know, I can't drink. I can't dance, right? I can't have any fun. And that's not true. At the heart of it, to have intimacy with God should be our greatest joy, right? Because we have this sense of freedom there too, that like we know that we're not actively part of the problem anymore. We know we're good with God. We know truly who we are, right? It, it tells us in 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and, and John and the other apostles, when they're sharing the truth about God, they said, man, we're, we're sharing, we're testifying about that which we've seen and heard and, and we've tasted and seen that God is good and he's transformed our lives. And, and now that we're sharing it with you, our joy can be made complete, right? He's actually saying it's not just that we, we understand that now there's something we have to do, right? That, that we, you know what, we're, we're obligated to share this with other people. No, he says that in sharing it, it's actually going to give us even greater joy, our obedience gives us joy because of the intimacy that we get to, to share, to have, to experience, right? And so something I see, even if you look at, at Romans 1, it talks about the fall. It talks about the, how the gospel has amazing power to save and redeem, but people in their sin have rejected God. And in rejecting God and their identity and trying to find their identity somewhere else, it resulted in their shame. It resulted in them giving up their joy. Look at the people around you. Look at your, yourself, right? Like, I'm reading Ecclesiastes with some, some guys, right? We're going through this devotional. And Ecclesiastes even opens up with Solomon saying, I tried to do this great experiment where I would just try to find joy, try to find happiness in all these places in the world, right? He's trying to seek, like, who am I? And he was really wealthy, so he just like did it big with money. He tried to do it big sexually. He's right, just he had so many wives and concubines and do whatever he wants, right? He tried to find joy and identity and all these different things, and they all left him down, right? It's kind of like, man, like life is so pointless and meaningless. Look at the people in the world. There's powerful, influential people committing suicide because that doesn't bring you joy, right? There's people that even decide like, 
I'm a man, but I'm gonna be a woman, and I'm gonna I'm gonna change that. We now have the ability to to cut things off and create things even on our body. And then there's even a lot of suicide there and confusion because we're like, who I am is not just what I look like or who I sleep with, right? And so then it's just this question of who am I? We give up our joy, right? When we try to find our identity anywhere else other than in the creator and sustainer of everything, right? But as we humble ourselves and allow God to reveal our true identity, the result is our greatest joy. Friend, you are not an accident. You were created on purpose and you have either responded to his call or he is still calling you because he desires intimacy with you. At the heart of it, who you are is created and called by Christ for the purpose of intimacy with the creator of the cosmos. Nothing could be more exciting. That is amazing news. That is the great news of the gospel. You don't have to be confused. You don't have to be uncertain. There is a truth to who you are. Who you are is prized by God, desired by God. And you have a purpose in your life. My prayer for you right, is that you would just accept that truth. Know the joy of your identity. He is a master craftsman. You are a good work. He loves you. Have a blessed week. Thanks for joining us today.